Um, thank you for coming to our Disney Scholar Series. We're excited to have Jennifer Doliak from the University of Virginia uh, presenting her work on Ban the Box policies. Um, we'll start with an opening prayer by Reed Empey, and then we'll turn the time over to Jennifer. Thanks so much. Our dear Sunday Father, we are so grateful for this day. We are grateful for the opportunity we have to gather to learn more about uh, the wonderful studies that are going on and the, the and to enjoy together the, the joy of discovery. And we ask that thy spirit might be with us, that we might be enlightened and to understand better the material that we will be presented with. Help us to... Uh, know how to apply these in our own studies, our own lives, and, and uh, follow those promptings to what curiosities might be piqued by this presentation. Please be with the presenter that she can have thy strength and thy spirit to be with her also. We love thee so very much and are grateful for all of those things that thou hast blessed us with. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, well thank you so much for having me. Um, I am going to talk uh, about my research on Ban the Box policies, but I'm also going to kind of give you a broad overview of what the literature on this is is, um, is leading towards. So uh, the broad motivation for, for my study and for work, sure, for uh, work in this area is that um, there's there's a lot of political will and public interest in reducing this country's reliance on mass incarceration. Uh, and the good news is that people are now being released from prison faster than they're being admitted. Um, the bad news is that based on the most recent data, about two-thirds of people who are released will be rearrested within three years. So obviously breaking that incarceration cycle is, um, is crucial if we, want to, uh, if we want to make any progress on this goal of, of reducing incarceration rates. Um, and there's some evidence, uh, it's not super strong, but there's some evidence that access to employment could reduce recidivism. And I think it kind of makes sense to a lot of us that that should help. Um, the, uh, and it is, it is somewhat mixed evidence. Um, the, um, the graph at the bottom shows a, um, the results of a, a landmark study by Diva Pager um, that uh, helps to motivate Ban the Box and a lot of other uh, uh, policies in this area, which shows that employers are, are really reluctant to hire people with criminal records. So a lot of people point to this reluctance as a, a major, um, major obstacle toward making progress on this goal. So in that graph, you see that um, uh, it's uh, she she sent out job applicants. Um, actors uh, posing as job applicants, um, some black, some white, and she randomized in the job applications that they had, whether they had a criminal record or not. And then found, and then looked at who got a call back um, inviting them for an interview as a positive signal of, of interest from the employer. And so, she, so the black applicants are on the left, the white applicants are on the right, the black bar is those with a criminal record, the gray bar is people without. Um, so obviously she finds that there are, major there are major racial differences in callback rates, which we know from a variety of, of other studies. Um, but she also finds that those with a criminal record um, are much less likely to get a callback than those without. Um, I think you know, this, this answered a question that I think was, uh, where the answer wasn't obvious to a lot of people. That there are a lot of reasons you might think that someone with a criminal record might not have good employment outcomes, but you know, they have lower education, less work history, all that other stuff. Um, but this is holding all that other stuff constant, right? So with the same job application, all the stuff that's on that piece of paper, uh, those with a criminal record had fewer callbacks than those without. And so I think the, the big question that the, the um, uh, that researchers like myself are, are trying to grapple with now is, is why is it that employers care about having a criminal record? <coughs> that's, that's one piece that I think the public conversation kind of uh, skirts over, but is really important as we start to think about what policy solutions might be effective. Um, so we know employers are discriminating against people with criminal records, but, but why is that? Is it just that there's something 
there's something about uh, having broken the law that they just can't get over? You know, is it, you know, they just, no matter what else you tell me about the person, if I know they have a criminal record, I just don't want anything to do with them? Or do they view that criminal record as being um, a signal of, of other negative qualities that might make them um, a worse employee? And, and my hunch is it's the latter one, and that's something uh, that economists call statistical discrimination. So it, it's, that's when they don't necessarily care about the criminal record in this case, the criminal record itself, but they're using the statistical correlation of having a record with other underlying characteristics that are correlated with that, but that are unobservable. Um, and so that's, that's why they pay attention to the criminal record. Um, and I should have said up front, feel free to interrupt me with questions along the way, and you know, economists interrupt each other all the time, so I'm, I'm used to it. Um, Actually, really quick. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you, uh, in, the, in the study that she did, mm -hmm. do we have any idea what um, sort of jobs that they were actually applying for? What industry, or, or was that broadly spread out, or how was that handled in that study? Yeah, great question. So these are basically all of the, the studies in this space are low-skilled, entry-level jobs. So think retail, fast food, restaurant, work, that sort of thing. Uh, that is largely because the vast majority of people with criminal records have very low education levels, um, and so that's those are the types of jobs they'd be most qualified for, um, especially coming out of prison. Yeah. I had a question on your last slide about yeah. the whole um, the two thirds of people being rearrested. Yeah. Does that vary based on how long you were incarcerated for, or how big your crime was? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good question. I'm not sure that we know that. Um, so one big challenge in doing research in this space, the data are really terrible. Um, we actually don't have, if you think about like the census and all the big economic surveys that we have to, to tell us about all kinds of things about you know, the American population, none of those surveys ask whether you have a criminal record. Um, and so we, we actually have very little, <laughs> we have very little right. data on this stuff. Um, but uh, so I think, and thinking through what's likely to happen there, I mean, you might expect that someone who's a more hardened offender would be more likely to, to recidivate after they get out. Mm -hmm. But if you're incarcerated, but we also know people age out of crime really quickly, like after age 35 or so, you're just very unlikely to, re to offend again. Okay. And so um, if you're in prison for a long time, you're probably a pretty low risk. All right, so, um, so why do employers care about criminal records? Um, so, so my guess is it's statistical discrimination, and so here are some things that, um, that we know uh, based on the data that do exist or in, in various surveys. We know that having a criminal record is correlated um, with, with various things that could lead to lower productivity, and, and again, if, if what most employers really care about is just hiring someone who is gonna show up on time every day and do a good job, then these might be reasons that, um, that a criminal record might be they might view a criminal record as valuable information. So we know that uh, people with criminal records have lower education, they have less work experience and interrupted work histories. Um, these populations have higher rates of untreated mental illness, substance abuse, emotional trauma. All of those things could be made worse by the experience of incarceration, right? So some of it could have been why they got in there in the first place. Some of it is just that we're not investing much in trying to rehabilitate them while they're there. Um, and, and those high recidivism rates I mentioned at the beginning mean that someone who is recently convicted or recently released from prison is pretty likely to be rearrested again in, in short order, uh, which means that if, again, if all you care about is someone who's gonna show up on time every day and go do a good job, hiring someone with a recent conviction means that there's a higher likelihood that there, a, a new arrest could take them off the job unexpectedly. So um, that, that could um, uh, make, them, uh, make them seem less reliable than if you have an applicant with no record, um, that that person can seem like a better bet. The other uh, factor that comes up a lot in employer surveys in particular is that a lot of employers seem very worried that hiring someone with a criminal record could put them at uh, risk of a negligent hiring lawsuit. Um, most, so, so policy in this country at this point um, is uh, guided by state law and also federal EEOC guidelines that tell employers that they need to use reasonable judgment um, when they consider what the, the person's criminal record, the job applicant's criminal record, um, in the context of job responsibilities. Employers are not allowed to have a blanket policy that prohibits them from hiring anyone, anyone that has a criminal record. So they have to be weighing it, considering each person um, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. 
The problem with this, this idea that they're just supposed to use reasonable judgment, is that in the worst case scenario, if that person commits a uh, another crime on the job, and the nightmare scenario here is that they assault a customer, then any previous conviction could look like a red flag to, to a jury, to the press, um, and, and that could be catastrophic for the employer. So you know, either because it's a lawsuit that they lose or just the bad press that puts them out of business. And so even if that probability is really low, it seems completely rational for an employer if, again, if they have a bunch of applicants to choose from and some have criminal records and some don't, it seems rational then for an employer to, to just call the, the folks without a record mm -hmm. first, right? Okay. So those are kind of the challenges we're up against. Those are, those are I think, the, the way I would frame the employer problem. Yes? Do employers have full information on the type of crime committed? So, so most job applications um, before Ban the Box would ask something like, uh, have you ever been convicted of a crime? If yes, explain. And so then you, so you're given space usually on the job applications to say, you know, I was convicted of uh, a misdemeanor, drug crime, and you can, you could say as much as you want. Um, you can say when it was. Um, there's some good evidence that employers do consider, you know, if, if this was a conviction from 10 years ago, they pay much less attention to it than if it was really recent. Um, they pay, they care less about misdemeanors than felonies. But yeah, so there's, they don't have perfect information, but they have, um, they have that information on the job application. And then if they run a formal background check at the end, they get the actual, um, the, the official record, um, uh, the extent that that conflicts with what the person's in their application. Yes? Just further on what they can add, is there, do we have any idea of like of situations in which people have sort of uh, ruined their situation by trying to explain and they sort of go into too much detail or they don't mm -hmm. explain it well enough? And so do we have any detail on that? Or? I haven't seen any research along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, the, the guidance that I generally see from, from advocacy groups that work with uh, with people with records is uh, the general advice is just is to be honest um, and so you know I think the best case scenario would be that you you explain what you did you uh, you know state it state it accurately and then either in person or on the application kind of make the case that you've learned you've changed right um, and uh, yeah so I'm not sure say so again I think the 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 concern is that if you if you don't say enough, or if you bend the facts a little bit, or uh, then then when they finally do the background check and they find out you lied, that could be much worse than um, than having just been honest up front. But um, but yeah, it's a good question. I'm not. I don't think we have evidence on that. Yeah. So at the end of the day, would you say that these kind of policies that are trying to get employers to be a little bit more flexible when it comes to hiring uh, ex-convicts? is try kind of trading what's optimal for the ex-convicts and maybe socially optimal for what's optimal for the business itself. So kind of encouraging the business to do something that's not optimal for them, but is going to be good for society. Is that kind of the trade-off we're dealing with? Potentially. I mean, I think um, it's interesting. I think the way that most most advocacy groups, especially on with Ban the Box, the way they frame it is that employers are making a mistake and they are clearly missing out on this great pool of job applicants, and if only they gave these people a chance, then they would discover all these wonderful workers. Um, as an economist, you know, my initial response to something like that is, you know, the employer has more incentive than anyone else to figure out who the good employees are gonna be, right? Uh, and if, you know, they pay a lot of money to background check firms and all the rest, and, and if there was some way to, and especially for these low-skilled jobs, there's so much turnover and like so many people who apply and seem enthusiastic just don't show up on the first day. And I mean, if they had some way to tell this person's going to be a good employee, they would like trip over themselves to hire them. So um, I think uh, I think there's a little bit of a sense in the public conversation that this can be a win-win, right? Uh, certainly, when you when we think more seriously about the policy problem here, it's it's very likely that there are there would be positive externalities to employers hiring more people giving more people a chance even if they wouldn't make great employees if there's some chance that that could uh, that work experience could contribute to reducing recidivism for the rest of us 
and and that would suggest that there's room for maybe public funding uh, in the form of tax credits, which we have for this sort of thing, right? I mean, basically finding ways to incentivize employers to uh, to do these things that would help all of us. Um, and the question is how to get them to kind of internalize these externalities, if you will. Okay, so uh, so one popular policy strategy in this space um, is that. A lot of places across the country have implemented these ban the box policies. And these are implemented at the city, county, and state levels. Um, they prohibited an employer from asking about whether a job applicant has a criminal record until late in the hiring process. Um, and the goal is to help some applicants who have records get their foot in the door and signal their work readiness in a job interview. So, so if we think that the pool of people with criminal <coughs> records is actually a real mix of people, um, and some of them would make great, great employees and a lot of them wouldn't. And if employers are statistically discriminating against people with records because they know on average they're worse than, they'd be worse employees than people without records, then that means that the people within that pool who would make great workers are being, are being hurt by this, right? Like they don't, they would, if they, if they had a chance to signal how great an employee they would be, they would, they would get the job, but without, um, Without that information, employers can't identify who these people are. So the goal here is, is you know, if, uh, the hope is that if we take the information about a criminal record away, employees, employers give everyone a chance, everyone gets a, a job interview, and those folks who have a record but would make great employees have a chance to signal that during the job interview, um, and they get a job. At least some of them will get a job. So um, these policies have been extremely popular. They're in place all over the country. By 2015, um, there were over 100 of these policies in effect across 34 states. At this point, it's a whole lot more than that. Uh, and President Obama has banned the, box on, uh, banned the box on federal job applications in late 2015. Um, there's now a bill going through the House to make that, that change permanent. Um, I'm not sure if I say it later or not, but um, so the, the one other feature of these is the, the policies um, can apply just to government employers, to private contractors that work with the government, or to private firms. They kind of vary on that dimension too. Okay, so here's a map by the end of 2015. You can see this is a high, so some, it's, it has gone into place in some states at the state level. Um, you can see it's a real mix of states. You've got California, but you've also got Nebraska, right? So one, one interesting feature of this, this political landscape is that, uh, and this is true for criminal justice policy broadly, I think, that there's broad interest on in both the left and right in, in making progress in this area. Um, so you've got you know, some very liberal advocacy groups that, propose, that are um, strong proponents of Ban the Box. You've also got Coke Industries as a, uh, one of the major proponents of Ban the Box. So you've got people on both sides. Other than those states, you can see this is a highly urban policy. It's mostly cities that pass this. Um, and so I, when I show you the results, I'll show you we can restrict, you know, we can, we can think about how, like, so what the empirical exercise here is going to be how do we find a decent control group or a nice counterfactual for the places that adopt Ban the Box. Um, and so, so we want to think about which places might look similar to places that, um, that adopted Ban the Box. Okay. Um, so, so we know that when employers condition employment on having a clean record, that's going to disproportionately hurt groups that contain more people with criminal records. That results in disparate impact on, um, on black men in particular and, and leads, I think that's been part of the motivation for this policy. It leads a lot of people, especially lawyers I find, <laughs> uh, to think we can solve the problem by just telling the employer not to use that information anymore. And that tends to be our approach to anti-discrimination policy in this country, which I think is, uh, is kind of the one, one of the, to me, more interesting conversations that come out, has come out of this research and, and kind of the broader literature on how information affects labor markets, but this idea that um, if if some if if the use of some information has a is statistically correlated with race, we tell employers not to use that information anymore. So, uh, so what happens when we remove information that employers care about? Unfortunately, they're they're not likely to just say oh, well, we'll just like, I guess I don't care about that anymore. Uh, they, they are very like, if it was something they cared about to begin with, they probably cared enough to try to guess about it now that they can't ask. And so that leads them to statistically discriminate against groups that are more likely to have the traits they want to avoid. Uh, this effectively broadens the discrimination from some members of the group to the entire group and can actually hurt disadvantaged groups more than it helps them. 
So it's this weird way, it, it, this weird situation where the, you know, the, um, a context that produces a disparate impact on, on protected groups, if we, have, if we have that kind of context, then removing the information that is causing the disparate impact actually makes the, project, the, the, the problem worse, not better. Um, uh, and so we have evidence from other contexts that this happens. There's this nice paper by Abby Wozniak on drug testing, showing that when employers are allowed to drug test their employees, they're much more likely to hire black men. Uh, that is consistent with the hypothesis that in the absence of information, they use race as a proxy for whether or not you're drug using. Um, similarly, uh, laws that ban credit checks by employers um, seem to reduce hiring for black men. So. Uh, on average, African Americans have lower credit scores than, than uh, white people do, and so um, when employers aren't allowed to ask what your credit score is, they just guess that black applicants have lower credit scores, and that hurts everyone, all the black applicants who have good credit scores, um, and reduces hiring for, for black applicants. Um, and similarly, you know, we, if we're looking at the impact of taking information about criminal records away, but this, this policy problem that employers really care about the criminal records is a relatively new one. Uh, before the 1990s and early 2000s with the advent of the internet and good computer databases, um, it was actually really hard for employers to check criminal records. Um, and so a bunch of people have looked at what the impact is of, uh, or impact was of those, of that increase in access to criminal records by employers, and generally found that as, as um, states and, and localities made it easier for employers to check someone's criminal history, uh, employment for black men went up. So basically, for, very much foreshadowing what we're finding with, with Ban the Box. And actually a lot of those, um, uh, kind of a, a longer um, version of this presentation actually have a bunch of quotes from some of those papers that just specifically warned about, it's like we, we definitely should not use something like a Ban the Box policy because very clearly we would be hurting black men who don't have criminal records. Um, uh, because they'll now be grouped in with, with black men who do. Um, and, uh, and so the other, the other small anecdote there is, um, you know, I talked to Sean Bushway about this, who's done a lot of work in this area, and he said, and I, you know, it's like, well, why didn't policymakers listen to you? You know, you, you guys all wrote these papers, it was made it pretty clear. And he said, oh no, we testified before the EEOC, we testified be before all these legislatures, um, and, and we warned them that ban the box would likely lead to more racial discrimination. And they said, uh, and the, all the lawyers and, and policymakers said, don't worry, racial discrimination is illegal. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> um, interestingly, it's still the response that we get to these papers. It's like, no, 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 that can't be possible. Racial discrimination is illegal. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so here we are, beyond the box. So that's, that's, that's sort of the context of like how information affects labor markets more broadly, right, in the broader literature. So now, beyond the box, beyond the box aims to increase employment with, with criminal records by preventing employers from asking about their criminal histories until late in the job application process. They can still check the record at the very end, um, but it's usually after, most state laws require it be after a conditional offer is made. Do you have a question? So yeah, yeah. so are there ways of cracking down on racial, racial discrimination? discrimination? Um, in theory, I mean, so that's usually my question for lawyers when they say, <laughs> well, we should just increase enforcement of our anti-discrimination laws. And I, yeah, I respond, well, tell me when the real enforcement starts, because I'd love to write that paper. Who is the enforcer in that market? Uh, EEOC, I think, yeah. I mean, so, um, it's just a really, it's, it's really hard to enforce, right? I mean, basically what you have to do is prove that employers didn't hire people because of their race or their gender or whatever. Um, and so if you're Walmart and you hire a zillion people every year and you've got a lot of data that, you know, they can look at statistical trends and um, then you should probably be worried. And those are the places that tend to get sued uh, for, for, racial dis for racial or gender disparities in, in hiring or promotion or whatever else. Um, but, you know, the restaurant down the street, it's just there's, unless, it's either it's Walmart who gets sued or it's the person who is dumb enough to like put it in writing like well we don't hire black people so he's out you know um, and so but if that doesn't happen it's in a lot of cases it's just it's probably the employer prob might not even know why it was that they just this applicant just seemed like a better fit for the job than this applicant um, so that's yeah I mean so that is 
my question for lawyers too, but a lot, it, it, I think there's a, a difference in worldview and, and priors of, between like social scientists and lawyers about what's possible and what we should do when a law doesn't seem to be working. It seems like a lot of lawyers, when they hear a law isn't working, they, they, their response is we need to enforce it better. Um, which isn't wrong, it's just not all laws are easy to enforce. Yeah? Even with someone like Walmart where the data is there, how does this get initiated? Uh, someone who didn't get hired by Walmart, Walmart, Walmart files a complaint to the EEOC, is that? Yeah, I'm not, and I don't know, this is where, you know, I don't always w want to be a lawyer, but every once in a while I wish I were a lawyer, and this is yeah, one of those times. Um, you know, so I, I imagine there's something about it. you need to have standing to, you know, do a bit of, you know, harmed. Um, I think you probably need enough people. I think in those situations it's more likely you'd have some sort of, like, class action because you need enough people to sue at once to show a statistical trend. Because still, in those cases, you're never going to be able to show that one person didn't get a job because of their race or gender. You have to show that systematically they weren't hiring women or whatever. All right. Um, so Ban the Box is, uh, is trying to solve this policy problem by, by preventing employers from asking about criminal histories. The main problem here is it doesn't, if employers, you know, employers don't want to hire people with criminal records for some reason, uh, Ban the Box doesn't address those concerns that employers have. Um, even if you think those concerns are silly, they have them, right? And, and this policy is not doing anything to address those concerns. Um, and so employers still don't want to hire people with criminal records if they didn't before. Um, and so hiding those criminal histories may just increase statistical discrimination against groups that are more likely to have convictions, uh, especially recent convictions, um, seems to be what employers care about. So in this case, the group we're worried about is young, low-skilled black men. Um, and so there have been two recent papers, uh, one by me and Ben Hansen at the University of Oregon, the other by Amanda Egan and Sonia Starr. Uh, and I should, that's, their paper just came out in the QJE, so I should change that date. Um, but they, uh, they take very different empirical approaches to the same policy problem, which is kind of nice. Um, we basically find the same answer, that Ban the Box seems to be increasing racial disparities in employment. This is the punchline graph from the A and Star paper. So just like the, the Diva Pager uh, paper from, that I talked about earlier, they ran a field experiment. Um, and unlike Diva, so Diva had you know, actors go out, black and white actors go out and actually apply for these jobs. Um, 10 years later, most of these jobs, even these entry level jobs, uh, most applications take place online. So even if you go into a McDonald's, they'll direct you to their website um, and ask you to apply online. So it made it easier for them to, um, to kind of credibly apply for jobs um, in a uh, kind of at scale. So they sent out, ten, they sent out thousands of uh, job applications um, from fake job applicants in New Jersey and New York City where Ban the Box was about to go into effect. So they sent out these job applications before and after the policy went into effect. Um, and they, they randomized the race of the person who was applying and, and in these types of studies that's done by uh, randomizing a, a, raci um, a stereotypically white or black name, um, so Jamal versus Greg, say. Um, and they also randomized uh, whether the person had a criminal history. I think in their, in their paper they were using um, a felony drug charge. They randomized a, dr a felony drug charge or a felony property uh, a conviction. Um, so nonviolent offenses. You should be thinking of these these types of um, of results as applying to um, nonviolent offenders um, with you know relatively low level felonies. Um, and so so what they're finding is uh, so the the black applicants are on the left, the white applicants are on the white. Uh, or on the, on the right, white applicants are on the right. Uh, and so the, the first two columns in each set show before ban the box. Um, and so that's when employers could see whether you had a criminal record or not. And we see again, um, like the study before, people with criminal record are called back at much lower rates than people without a criminal record. What's interesting here is that they don't find the big racial gap that Diva found. So Diva's paper you know, was around 2000. Um, in Milwaukee, um, this is this took place in 2015, 2016 in New York City, New Jersey. So, you know, there are a variety of differences between those two contexts. But um, it is interesting that they 
this others in, in kind of the, the discrimination literature have suggested a lot of the racial gap and a lot in, in variety of outcomes could be due to, to employers worrying that, that uh, black applicants have a criminal record. And this would certainly be supportive of that, that actually employers don't use race at all in their hiring decision. They only care about the criminal record. Um, after Ban the Box went into effect, that's like the two gray bars, they find that the black applicants are called back at a rate that's in between the two rates before. So they're now, they now seem to be statistically discriminating and, and assuming that um, the likelihood that a black applicant has a record is somewhere in between the, the um, uh, is a, you know, that the, the pool of black applicants is a, a mix of people with and without criminal records. Um, for the white applicants, interestingly, they're called back at least at the same rates as folks, as white applicants without a record before, um, maybe even a little higher. Um, and so that suggests that all the, any white applicant was given the benefit of the doubt and assumed not to have a record um, when they got the call back. So in the end, what they wound up finding is that Ban the Box increased racial disparities in callbacks sixfold, um, and that was really led by a big, uh, or driven by a big increase in callbacks for white applicants with records. Um, you know, the real, the huge um, benefit of a study like this is it's randomized. You know, you kind of, it's kind of the, the gold standard in any kind of experiment or any kind of uh, policy evaluation. Um, the big drawback of a study in this, uh, like this is that they could only see callbacks. They couldn't see who actually gets a job. Um, these are fake applicants. It's in a couple different cities, especially knowing that most employers are going to run a background check at the end anyway. A lot, of folks, a lot of the folks who have records who got their foot in the door might not get an offer in the end, right, um, if employers don't want to hire someone with a record. So the question is, well, who actually winds up with a job? Um, but this is certainly very suggestive that employers do statistically discriminate um, when they can't ask about a criminal, but statistically discriminate based on race when they aren't allowed to ask about a criminal record anymore. Yes? Uh, have you had any trouble with employers getting upset when they find out about all these fake <laughs> You know, I presented this in a psychology department recently and they were just like flabbergasted that IRB would let us do, would let economists do stuff like this. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, IRB is just, I think I have heard, every once in a while I get an email, I ran a field experiment many years ago, um, and uh, so kind of had to go through IRB for that. I occasionally get emails from people who are having a really hard time with their IRBs, um, because they, they view it as really wasting employers' time. Um, I think for, for speci especially for labor markets like this, employers are getting so many applications from people who just don't follow through. Um, and in these cases, in each employer, I think over the course of about a year, got four ap four extra applications, four applications for fake applicants. So it's not like it's not like they're sent like the thousands of applications to like the one McDonald's branch or something. <laughs> um, so hopefully they're they're not wasting their time too much. But that's basically the trade off that IRBs want you to make. It's like, what's the value of the knowledge you might gain um, versus how much you're wasting people's time? And of course, you also don't want the applications to seem weird to the employer, right? I mean, for the, the research to be valuable, you also have to, um, you need your applications to blend in with the broader pool. And so if, if you've gotten to the point where the volume is actually wasting their time, then there are probably other problems with, with the results you're finding. Okay, so this is the paper I have with Ben. So, um, so they said the big, so Amanda and Sonia had this really nice randomized experiment that they can't, that they only get to callbacks. We do not have a nice randomized experiment, but we can see who has jobs. Uh, so it's kind of a nice set of papers in that way. So we use the gradual rollout of band the box policies um, over time across the country as a natural experiment um, and to, to test the effect of that policy on the employment of young, low-skilled men. Um, and so these graphs show you the, the residuals from our regression. So basically these are the, kind of the leftover variation after we um, control for uh, pre-existing differences between different, different cities and pre-existing trends and, and other kind of time-varying characteristics. So, so this is all that this is. This is the leftover variation we couldn't explain, and that's what we're going to attribute to the effect of band the box. So we can see that for young white men, we're finding no impact on average. Uh, for young black men, we see that. Um, so the in this graph, the red line is is folks who live in places without band the box. The blue line is people who live in places that adopt band the box. 
So after that line, they seem, you know, the kind of the standard in this, when you do this kind of exercise, you want like parallel trends across the two different places. They seem, those lines seem to move together before the, before the law change and after the law change, they separate quite a bit, right? Um, and, and in this case, the people who are, the black men who live in b places with ban the box do much worse than the black men who live in places without ban the box. Um, and so the overall reduction in employment for black men is, is 5%. Uh, we can do to the same exercise for Hispanic men, um, and they have uh, their employment goes down by 2.9%. Um, I will talk a little bit about the the effect for for black men is much kind of much more robust and um, all of that. Yes. Yeah. So um, I just have a question about the the black men one. So in your yeah. paper, you say a major threat to identification is if like if they were doing something else at the same time as ban the box, like if they were doing other things to promote hiring of of ex cons. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering like if you were ever concerned about maybe they implemented ban the box policies in response to maybe a negative trend or something like that. Mm -hmm. If you were what you did to resolve those concerns. Yeah, so that's um, the the idea that the policies are implemented in response to a pre existing trend is sort of the in some ways the easiest thing to to take care of because you can just control for pre existing trends. Right? Um, or if the places that on average have um, have uh, lower employment rates, employment rates for black men, if they're the, they're the ones who are likely to, um, to adopt these policies, then, uh, then we could just control for those pre-existing differences. Um, the, so I'll, I'll go through kind of what we, everything that we control for and kind of how I think about what's left over. Um, uh, so yeah, so why don't we revisit that then? Anything else? Thing you yeah. is, uh, or just mentioned ben, ben Hansen's one of the alumni. Oh, that's right. Stuff. Yes. And it kind of connects with this. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Ben is a, is, um, a BYU alum. And you wonderful Ben. <laughs> Excellent researcher. Um, all right, so we're going to use the data, for, uh, data from the current population survey. Uh, so this is monthly data from 2004 to 2014. Uh, it's cross-sectional data. Um, I think the, the big feature of this data set uh, that, that matters here is it excludes anyone who is institutionalized at the time of the survey, so that includes people who are incarcerated. Uh, so this, this could bias our results in the sense that if ban the box is reduced <coughs> employment for some people uh, and they wind up being in, be committing crime and being incarcerated as a result, then they'll be dropped from our sample. Um, so we think that will bias us toward finding that ban the box is more helpful than it is because anyone who's hurt by it is gone. Um, so we're going to focus on young, low-skilled men. We're, descri we're, we're defining that as, as uh, men who are 25 to 34 years old uh, without a college degree. Um, and we're going to code all of the, the treatment of the, or the law changes at the, the Metropolitan Statistical Area level, MSA level. Um, this is the, you know, what the census uses as the definition of a local labor market. It's kind of a commuting zone. Um, we, we do this to be for to be more conservative, so basically the idea is if any if any city within your MSA adopts ban the box, we're going to say that that's we're going to consider that a shock to your labor market opportunities. Um, some people in that MSA might not realistically be be affected by by a change, kind of you know an hour drive away or something. In that sense, in that case, we would be coding some people as treated when they aren't. That should bias us toward not finding any effect of the policy. Okay, so here's. Um, our empirical strategies. So we're going to control for the effect of. Um, uh, we're, gonna, we're, we're looking at the, the probability that an individual is employed to so an individual level data. We're going to control for MSA fixed effects, for individual demographics of, of the people in the sample. So and we do this as flexibly as possible. So we have age, year of education, <coughs> all that stuff. Uh, time by region fixed effects. Um, so this allows us to control flexibly for for shocks. Uh, that affect your entire census region uh, month by month. And then MSA specific linear time trends. And then it, in our main specification, we interact all of that with race and ethnicity. So it's basically equivalent to running each of these regression, regressions separately for black men, white men, and Hispanic men. Um, and so this full set of controls is, is adjusting for the employment probability for men of the same race or ethnicity in his MSA the employment trend for that race or ethnicity in his MSA, monthly region-specific employment shocks, and here the main thing we're worried about is the, the housing crash that happened in you know, 2008 around that area. So we want to control for that really flexibly. 
and his individual characteristics. So his age, his uh, education level, all that. What's left is idiosyncratic variation or idiosyncratic individual level shock. So if someone gets sick or they a fight with their boss, uh, hopefully that's not correlated with Band the Box. Um, and also local level employment shocks such as Band the Box policies. So our identifying assumption here is that there are no other local employment shocks that coincide with the adoption of Band the Box. Um, the most likely threat to identification, we think, is that Ban the Box is adopted by places that are motivated to help people with criminal records get jobs and that are motivated to reduce racial disparities in hiring. Um, we think that that motivation alone should lead to better outcomes for the groups that we're going to focus on. Um, so we think this should bias us toward finding a more positive impact at Ban the Box. So this is our, uh, this is our, our main, re main result table. So in blue there is our preferred specification with all our main controls. Um, you can see that there's a 3.4 percentage point reduction in employment for black men, 2.3 percentage point reduction for Hispanic men, so that's equivalent to 5% for black men, 5% of the baseline for black men, and about 2.9% for Hispanic men. And then we, we think about, again, with like the, main, the main goal here is to think about what's a good counterfactual or to make sure we're kind of uh, uh, controlling for as much of the other variation as possible, and so we we can restrict the sample a little bit. So as I show you in that first map, this is a really urban policy. Um, and so maybe we want to restrict attention to just metro areas. And so we can do that, and we get basically the same thing. We can restrict attention to just places that eventually adopt Ban the Box, so, uh, so kind of restrict to similarly motivated places, if you will, find basically the same thing. And we can even control for monthly MSA-level unemployment rates, um, which is a little bit tricky because if we think, because it's possible this policy would actually reduce overall employment if we think it makes hiring more costly. But, uh, but if it doesn't do that, if jobs are just being shifted around, then this, this allows us to control for um, just other, other local shocks that maybe we're missing. Um, and again, we find the same thing. So we think all of our, all of our controls um, up to, call, like by column five, we're pretty much, our controls are, are doing a good job of, of picking up everything other than Band the Box. We can also look at how these, these uh, effects persist over time. So it's possible this is just kind of a, a short-term shock to the labor market. This is, you know, everyone kind of figured out how to find good employees based on the previous rules, and now there are new rules. It's just going to take some time to adjust. Um, so we look at, like, one year out, two years out, three years out, and so on. We find that for black men, in fact, the effect grows over time. For Hispanic men, it seems to go, grow up to, like, year two, and then it goes down to zero. So it does seem like Hispanic men seem to figure out a different way to signal their employability to, to employers. Um, this is actually consistent with other work in, uh, in, in labor economics showing that Hispanic men are much more likely to get jobs through like, their networks. Um, so if you think about like, how would I signal, how do I get like, that, that employer to, to know I'm a good bet? Like maybe you have a friend vouch for you, right? And so that's, it's possible that you know, Hispanic men are just better at doing that. For whatever reason, black men don't seem to figure out a way um, to, to adjust here, and employers don't either. Um, we can also see, I know I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to kind of maybe skip over a couple things, but these, this is showing that the effect is much bigger when the, uh, when un the unemployment rate is, is higher, um, which is consistent with the idea that employers have a lot more power to discriminate when they have a lot of applicants to choose from, right? So if you have hundreds, hundreds of applicants for one job, you can, you can you know, throw away all the applicants from black men, if you don't, you, it's much harder to, to, um, to discriminate. So we basically are finding that effect. Um, let me skip to uh, kind of policy implications a little bit. So overall, the, the main punchline of this study and the, the Egan and Star study are, are really that Ban the Box seems to have really big unintended negative consequences on black men who don't have records um, and there are a lot of them, and so that winds up dragging down employment rates um, across the board. Um, what's less clear at this point is whether there are benefits for people with records. I think we had all assumed that some men with records would be, would be better off. Some of them are, are going to get their foot in the door and actually get a job. The two nice studies on this so far suggest that's not the case. So there's one in Massachusetts that suggests that ban the box actually reduced employment for people with criminal records. 
which is consistent with the idea that this just makes it harder to find good matches, um, and it's just wasting everyone's time to have people interview for jobs they're not going to get. Another study um, in Seattle shows uh, no impact on people with, uh, with records. Yeah? Uh, from, from your results, it seems possible that uh, white men or white applicants with a criminal background might benefit disproportionately. Were you able to find anything like that? Um, so we were able, so it's one of the slides I skipped over. Uh, well, we were able to find that um, that uh, white, that ban the box laws that applied to private employers. So similar to the Egg and the Star study, that's the context they ran it in. We find that um, employment for young, low-skilled white men goes up. So it seems like employers are substituting from young black men to young white men when it's a private ban the box law. They seem to substitute from young black men to older black men when it's a government ban the box law. So that's the little bit of a difference there. Okay, so what do we do instead? So, um, so if employers are statistically discriminating against people with, cr with criminal records because they think that those people make worse employees, then the question is how can we figure out what it is they're worried about and, and directly address those concerns? So, uh, and note, this is the opposite of the lawyer's approach, which is just to tell them not to ask anymore, right? So we're going to ask them more. <laughs> we're going to ask for more detail about what they care about and actually try to address those concerns. Um, so one option is to provide better signals about job applicants' uh, work readiness or employability, um, which is kind of what getting them in the door was supposed to do, except they have to still have to get in the door, and that's the hard part. Um, and so you can imagine signals like, graduating from a really respected reentry program that's tough to get through, or uh, there are these court-issued employability certificates now where you can go to a judge and argue that you've been rehabilitated, have character witnesses and all this stuff, and he can give you a piece of paper that says you've been rehabilitated. Um, and uh, that could provide a better signal about your work readiness if people trust the judge's judgment. Um, they can also uh, get to the second bullet point, which is addressing legal liability concerns. So uh, a court issue certificate that says you're no longer a risk seems like a pretty good defense against a negligent hiring lawsuit. So um, there's good reason to think these might work. And indeed, there's been a really nice audit study showing, a couple now actually, showing they do seem to help. So again, send out fake job applications, randomize whether you have a, a, a felony record, a felony record and an employability certificate, or no record at all. People with the certificate are called back at equal rates to people with no record at all. So that seems to help. The question is if it's the legal liability piece that, that was the key or if it's the information piece. Maybe it's both. This is kind of the, this is the research frontier we're talking about now. Um, the, other, the other kind of um, set of things that we can start investing in is finding ways to actually improve the average work readiness for people with criminal records. So the reason, employ if the reason employers don't want to hire people with records is they think that as a group, they don't make great employees, then we need to find what better ways to prepare them for the job market, right? Um, and you know, we've basically, our, our policy for the last couple of decades has been to throw people into prison with no investment in rehabilitation, no real education or job training or anything else. Uh, so we could actually start investing in that stuff um, and that, that might be helpful. It's probably going to be important to invest not only in those in like education and job training, but also things like better medical care, substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment, um, providing stable housing, providing child care to those who need it. People coming out of prison have a, a wide array of needs, and that makes this a tough problem to deal with. But um, uh, that also makes it an important and, and, uh, and interesting, I think, policy problem. And this is now what I spend a lot of my time doing, and it's a, uh, something that I try to encourage especially grad students um, to do a lot of research on it because it turns out we know almost nothing about a help, how to help this group. Um, but uh, we need to figure it out. I'll stop there. Uh, I know it's almost time, but if there's any final questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah? I guess any lessons from like other countries that have dealt with some similar problems? So the US is, a, has, is pretty unique. Mm -hmm in its criminal justice system, so we incarcerate a lot more people than other countries do. Um, there was an interesting <coughs> study that came out of Norway a couple of years ago that showed that uh, used randomization across judges to measure what the impact of being incarcerated was on your job outcomes, because um, some judges vary in their likelihood that they're gonna send you to prison. 
And they found that in Norway, the person who was on the margin of being incarcerated or not, if they went to prison, they were much better off than if they hadn't gone. Um, which suggests that it's possible to do prison well, right? Like Norway seems to have figured out how to, how to, um, to uh, you know, use the time of people who are incarcerated wisely and, you know, people have kind of joked it's like being sent to job training camp um, with plenty of, like, mental health treatment and, and anything else you could possibly need. Um, and, yeah, people are better off when they go through that experience. That is not the experience in the United States. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, there's interest in changing that, but it's a question of how much, how much we're going to be willing to put our, our money where our mouths are on that issue. Thanks Great. A lot. Thank you.